Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is going beyond recommendations. So it's really going to be looking at how we can use data in our design and services. And actually, if we want to go past just pure um, kind of you should buy this, what to look at next, how can we do it and why aren't people achieving it so far? So something that I've started to see more often is at the moment, like data scientists talking about data, actually having data drive services seems to be a key thing that's coming up again and again with clients. And I started to kind of wonder, why don't we have all these skills already? And where are the data scientists at right now? Um, I don't know if there's any in the room at the moment. Raise your hand if you are. No? OK. We've got a couple. They're, they're super rare in agencies as well. They are um, incredibly valued members of our teams. And actually working together with them gives us much, much more powerful services. So when I started thinking about this, I started looking at actually all the different things we're talking about now. So AI, chatbots, different types of recommendations, it's all driven by data. But a lot of the time, we don't have that data to actually drive the services. And I started to wonder, actually, why? What's gone wrong um, that we, don't, we haven't laid those foundations already so that we can kind of empower the services of the future? So if we just take a little step back actually to what, um, what we can do with data, there are three different ways that we can actually work with data as a designer. The first being um, to design with data. So that's all kind of about making sure it's right at the heart of your product. You are kind of enabling that feedback loop and it's actually involved in all of your decision making about how to progress and where to move forward. The second way is design by data, so that's things like AI or rules-based systems actually empowering um, either the UX or the UI to change as and when depending on user behaviours. And the last one is design for data. So this one is actually when you really understand how taxonomies are working, how you can use kind of natural language processing, what you can actually do when you leverage these kind of different types of data you're collecting, you can really use it to empower a service. So what's happened now that it's kind of, it's the thing that people are talking about. I think it's all about the change in your expectations. This is probably um, a tweet that I found that really explains it well for me, is we've gone through this huge cultural shift. It's like, don't talk to strangers, don't put, talk to people on the internet, they could be really scary. Now we're like, come on, come and pick me up, stranger. I want to go somewhere. And it's just a totally different mindset. And we're kind of, um, we feel OK to do that because an app has basically verified that for you and said, this person is safe, get in their car. They have so many recommendations. And it's a really different culture that we're in now to where we were before. And part of that's driven kind of by, I think, people being selfish. Um, you want what you want, when you want it, and how you like it. And it's all about tailored services for me. This is the more popular acronym for that, which I can't actually say, but um, I won't try. Uh, but basically, we've kind of we've got these two disparate things going on. So we've got the rise of kind of ethical consumers, people thinking about society and how we interact with each other and how we sort of actually behave for good together. But at the same time, we want what we want and we want it to be right for us. So it's like, where is this tipping point between that kind of the rise of ethics, but also kind of the rise of being actually selfish? I think that's something we're experiencing um, when we're actually designing systems. And a lot of the time, you wouldn't just be designing one part of a system anymore. It's all about kind of these fluid journeys throughout them. So you might have um, stuff on TVs, physical shops, email campaigns, digital, multiple apps, different services. And people expect them all to be tailored for them, remember them across all of them, and actually really be kind of empowering ecosystems. The next thing we've had is Internet of Things. It's gone a step even further. We've got these things in our homes. They're supposed to be kind of um, there to empower us. But we seem to be just collecting the data and not necessarily actually doing that much with it yet. It just seems to be all about harvesting, harvesting, and then what happens next. So if we have all these different channels and we have the tools to actually use them, so we have things like machine learning that can process these huge data sets, we should be able to have hyper-personalized services. But it seems that at the moment, it's almost kind of those services are being designed by the few. So it's the, sort of the really big players. They have access to the amount of data they need to actually do these tailored services. So time and time again, we see people like Google, Facebook, Amazon actually being able to succeed in this kind of world that we all want to get into. And it's just, it seems a little bit like far away for people right now. Um, my suggestion on that is actually that we're not designing for data and with data to begin with. We're not baking it into our products and services to enable us to get to that point. So I'm going to talk to you um, kind of through a case study where we use data a hell of a lot. Um, 
It's unfortunately not launched yet, so I can't actually show you the full details, but I'm going to talk through some of the theories and the ways that we use data to actually drive decision making within it. So it's for Netta Porter. I'm sure you guys are all kind of aware of them. They, um, they started and uh, were the first shoppable magazine. They're kind of there in the um, early days in the 2000s. They're kind of revolutionizing e-com. But now there are much smaller players actually kind of capitalizing on their market share and being more innovative. And it almost seems as if if you're one of the people who gets there first, you have to continuously innovate. And as you scale, it's very difficult to do that because you start to behave like a much bigger um, player. So what we wanted to do was actually look at how we combine all the data that we've got from um, historical uh, use of the products and services, but also actually look outside of just the data we get from them and how we can bring in other data sets to really supplement that and push it on a lot further. So I'm going to talk about three different types of data. I'm sure you've heard of them before, but um, there's thick data, which is very um, all about sort of the quality of information. It's actually gathering real insights from real people. It's much more about behaviors and opinions. You have big data, so the stuff that we're kind of gathering all the time, we hear about it. It's, uh, you know, as soon as you go beyond a certain point and it's very difficult to process, we have all of that big data. I'm going to talk to you about wide data. I didn't really know what to name this one, but I'm going to describe it and hopefully you'll agree that wide makes sense in terms of this kind of definitions. <laughs> but um, so this kind of gave us the who, the why, and the how, and actually what we're going to do with it. So the different types of data that we use, we had thick data, so we had um, personal shopper interviews. A lot of their customers are very high net worth individuals. They actually have a premium service where you get a personal shopper just for you. So it's very similar to going to a high-end department store. These people know everything about your lives. They even get invited to people's weddings. They're that close with the customers that they're serving because they're talking to them every single day. So it was a really good way of getting those insights across a lot of people. We also had lots of stakeholder interviews. So within that business, you have people who are dedicated to e-com, but you also have people who are dedicated actually to editorials. So they have quite different sides of the same um, business to talk about. And we had user interviews to kind of round it all off as well in terms of thick data. Um, big data-wise, we had voice of the customer survey, so huge data sets that they gathered over long periods of time. We had the different shopping patterns and reading behaviors of the editorial that they were already putting out and how people were already shopping with them. And then wide data, which I'm terming as industry trends and competitor analysis. So it's actually looking outside of your system, going much wider. And it's not just about direct competition, because right now we're competing with everybody. So in terms of perceptual kind of competitors, you go into, you're competing with Uber and Airbnb just as much as we would be competing with Farfetch when we're talking about fashion. People have these expectations that services are going to be that good. So you need to look across actually where, who's leading across everything rather than just be in your specific um, sectors. Um, and then obviously we have industry trends within the e-com and within luxury fashion itself, um, social insights and habits and what are people actually searching for. So we know that a lot of the time when you're actually coming to buy something, unless you're a very loyal customer, you're going to have come through search. So actually what are the different ways that people are searching for fashion now to actually um, look and see what they can buy. Uh, the insight that that kind of all combined up into was who to target right now and the near future, and actually how can we increase how much they're spending, how much they kind of read with us, and what we can do with that. Who next? So actually, who are going to be the next generation that are going to be supporting Netaport for the future? And from this, we can see people who maybe don't have the fashion spend right now, but are very likely to become the customers that we're targeting right at the moment. Uh, what to say, so a lot of this project was actually around content strategy and using content to actually reinforce fashion buying behaviours and actually looking at a content framework for seeing kind of who we can actually target. Um, how to say it, which is all about tone of voice, which becomes increasingly important when you have so many different systems that you're going across. You need to be speaking with um, a single tone of voice that you can flex and change depending on the medium, so defining that up front is really important, and also publishing models, so where you're publishing, when you're publishing, why you're doing that type of content, on which platforms. So I'm going to go through them in a bit more detail, but um, this is probably one of the best examples for different ways that people actually use fashion. So you have almost, it's not, it, we didn't go for personas, we went for behavioral modes, so it's much more about how you shift between two ways of buying fashion. So you may be using fashion as something to advance your career and actually as an armor, and you go into a place and you dress in a certain way to give off a certain type of um, kind of atmosphere from yourself and actually feel confident. And it's very much 
about building up those pieces for yourself. And the other way is kind of dressing for fun or the more kind of um, just for style, for trends, for that very much for the consumer who's always going to be buying the new things. And people actually switch between these depending on the times of day, depending on how they're feeling, depending on how confident they'll be in a real world situation. I think it's really important when you think about fashion to actually understand the context of where people will be wearing these clothes and actually how those clothes make them feel because we're not just giving people an outfit that will be worn once. Hopefully it will be worn multiple times across many different contexts and actually understanding the different ways that it can be used and resurfaced among that is really important. So one of the things that I spoke about was the content framework. So we knew they were producing a hell of a lot of editorial, but it was um, across very different publications. It wasn't all um, kind of gathered together. And it was part of their kind of DNA. They were the world's first shoppable magazine, effectively. So what can we do with that? If we know that you have an incredible editorial capability, how can we push that on and make it kind of truly cross-platform and very, very digital? And for that, we started off with um, actually looking at search trends. And when it comes to fashion, there's a lot about how do I do this, why do I do it, what occasion should I wear this on. And a lot of people are looking for reassurance actually how to do different things. And um, it's all about people will go to fashion when they need it immediately, if it's something for tomorrow or it's something for today. So they have a service where you can actually get something delivered very, very, very quickly. Um, they may be doing comparison shopping across multiple retailers or um, they just need some ideas. So quite often, fashion can just be pure inspiration. So when we're looking at the types of editorial they're producing, a lot of it's very much inspirational pieces. And from there, we kind of put together a framework for them, making sure that we were looking at who was producing what types of content across which different medias, and actually where they can have the biggest advantage, because other people weren't doing this, but we could see that there was a latent user need that actually wasn't being fulfilled by other publishers. So it kind of all came together to um, kind of inspire fashion confidence, and this is something that we really um, wanted to reinforce. So when you're making these high purchase decisions, you want to feel that you've made the right decision. So it's all about making sure it's the right size for you, it's going to suit you, it fits in with your style. And because we have all those different shopping behaviors from them, we actually know a lot about the way that people behave and think about fashion. And then lastly, that comes together in the publishing model. So actually understanding when people are shopping, what types of things they're shopping for, can drive an editorial calendar as much as kind of the fashion calendar can. And if we bring in that also with then looking at different um, social trends, we can target different platforms for the right types of editorial actually across a life cycle. And all of this kind of came together and we ended up with personalization, which was unique as their customers. And sometimes this is starting to be called cognitive commerce. If you do it to the level that is um, technically possible, you get into preemptive pieces. So if, um, and you start behaving almost as their personal shoppers would. So you know people's calendars, you may know um, who they might be meeting, you may have an idea of some level of context. This is the type of relationship that you have with a personal shopper. Can we actually bring that to this service if we have those data points? The Theoretically, yes, we can. And from that, we can actually bring this really, really to home and actually behave as these, like a digital personal shopper for everyone. So it's not just that the high customers were getting it, everybody could get it across the system. And I would love to have been able to show you it, but it effectively kind of drove our feature sets. But um, from there, we reframe them much more as a service. So it's actually about being a fashion best friend and giving that advice and preemptively actually giving people suggestions on what you can do with it and using that um, content to inspire the confidence that people need. So that's looking at kind of a project that um, I've done, but I also thought it'd be good to look outside. So who's doing it well? I mentioned it before, we see things um, like Google Now. So it's gone from simply organizing the information to actually harnessing it, so you can search within your account. This is an example of actually um, looking at flights. So if you know that your flight's going to be delayed, you can be notified about that. They have that information. One of the areas that I've actually found myself um, has happened, so I've rebooked a flight. So if for some reason, it thinks that I'm flying back from the same destination twice. So it's a little bit confused about that. So it's much better than it was, and I actually can see where my next flights are but it's got both of them in there too, so it can't actually reconcile that information quite yet. Then we have people like Netflix where everything is a recommendation. So you have a wall of recommendations. It's all personalized content, but they've actually gone further than that to actually make sure that 80% um, of what users are watching comes from recommendations. And it's actually driving the content production as well. So they're using the data to not only actually inform how the product 
is serving people, but actually what content you can produce. And I would say that if you are producing content as part of your work, you should actually be doing that feedback loop as well and using it to drive what you should be producing to actually gather people in. So the challenges and why haven't we all got there? First one is actually getting hold of the data. People um, don't necessarily aren't always that happy with giving data out. Um, but if we combine multiple data sources, we can give far more insight than just one set alone. So you saw how we took the three different types of data and actually used those to drive every single part of the content strategy and publishing model. Uh, second one being understanding the data. So effectively, the data is there, but in aggregate, it is not actually that good. You need to actually be able to understand how to draw insights from it. Machine learning can help you with that. It loves the patterns, but actually defining the context around that and finding the why can be difficult. Machine learning also sometimes is a bit of a black box. You don't necessarily know why a decision has been made. I'm going to start skipping through slides a bit quicker as well. Um, designing in the infinite. So if we go into the world where machines are defining our interfaces and we're going completely personalized, they're going to be making those decisions. And we go from being purely... Um, kind of componentized designers to actually a designer who's working with a machine. And the machine is as much part of our design team as actually any other member would be. And we have the consequences of what we're doing. So if we go down these kind of much more algorithmically generated systems, the what ifs become much more important. So what if everyone in the world used your service? How is that actually going to change society? And what is the worst thing that could happen if it actually goes wrong? So these are the five things that I would say you need to remember if you are going to try and include data as a member of your design team. Data doesn't actually equal insight. You need to actually be able to understand, see where the patterns are, map those to your KPIs, make sure you really, really do understand what data does mean and how that's affecting your system. Match the thick data with big data and wide data, so those industry insights, cross-trends, the perceptual competitors. Um, set up a data and measurement strategy. So understand how different bits of data are actually building up into your business model and what that means when those fluctuate because sometimes it's not always what you think it would mean. Um, hypothesize and test, so use the right data at the right time. Make sure you're not always covering every single piece of data that you're collecting. Make sure that you're kind of getting in there, defining it, running those small tests and seeing those small changes. And be transparent and responsible with data. Something that I haven't talked about really is... Um, GDPR, GDRP, I can never say that one either. I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but it's the changes in data regulations. So actually making sure that you're compliant with those, you understand data security, and that if you are going to be using it to drive services, you're responsible with what you're doing. And then hopefully, we'll get hyper-personalized services. And that is it for me.